also I'm going to quote Moko talking about practices of magic in uh, Salonika, and then I'm going to talk about the people who actually performed the magical spell. The city of Salonika was very important as a center of Jewish and secular culture during the 16th century. Astronomers, poets, and physicians of high standings had found refuge in our city. As alongside the study of Talmud, they studied medicine and natural sciences in the academy. However, at the beginning of the 18th century, an intellectual decline took place, which accelerated rapidly. In the 18th century, the study of Kabbalah, with all its formulas and ridiculous practices, invaded the community. I won't comment on, 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 on his bias, but that's a different issue. The whole atmosphere <clears throat> was pervaded with mysticism. The Salonican Jews sank into a state of medieval ignorance. This is also the effect of the false Messiah Shabtai Tzvi a century or two earlier. They did not wake up from their lethargy until the last quarter of the 19th century thanks to the beneficial actions of the school of the Alliance. For more than two centuries, the Jewish population believed in the power of fortune tellers and magicians who utilized the hidden forces to fend off misfortune through the use of amulets and charms to foretell the future and to cure deadly illness. Okay, now, there's what's called in the Judeo-Spanish the indulco, magical spells. There was a time when the populace attributed all maladies to two main courses, main causes, fear and the evil eye. So the remedies of these healers of the East are direct descendants of magical practices and fashion during the Middle Ages. Incantations, exorcism, and Kabbalistic formulas were all accompanied by mysterious symbolic practices and resulted, according to common belief, in miraculous benefits in cases where science proved to be ineffective. Amongst these practices, the indulco, the magical spell, is the most powerful. I'll just give you a short excerpt of part of the ceremony. The undas indulcadera, who is usually a bent old woman who pronounces the magic formulas through a toothless mouth, will take a sieve in which she places a shirt of the sick person and an egg. Her next act is to take a small jar in which she pours a little water pronouncing the name of the patient. And it goes on and on. At each operation, the old woman would use three new pieces of lead added to the existing pieces. The three pieces would become six and then nine, and every addition with ad hoc formulas she would invoke with the help of the patriarchs, usually a rabbi or a very religious person or a mystic, and certain other miraculous pious men. Finally, the egg, which, as we have noted, is in the sieve, is now transferred to the jar. The patient is expected to crack the egg into the jar with his right hand. The water holding the yolk and the white of the egg now has special properties, according to the popular belief. With this mixture, the patient is expected to wash his face. And it goes on and on, and there are many different steps. This sounds like a bunch of superstitious hogwash, but this is part of the, the Sephardic culture. But to put it on a, in a more analytic but, but actually practical way, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, there was a family which also came from the region, from Salonika in, in Monastir, who had all sorts of these practice. And one of their descendants, his name was Beni Nachmias, wrote a book called Hamsa, of various Jerusalem Sephardic uh, remedies which for all sorts of ailments. So the remedies were also natural uh, plants, for example, and spices, but the remedies also were religious and ceremonial, and part of the ceremonies were from Kabbalistic uh, rituals and phrases and, and, uh, and incantations, let's say, put in parchment and, and encapsulated in various places. So, in, for example, I, I interviewed once a Sephardic Jew who survived the Holocaust from Salonika, and he had an amulet 
it wrapped, it wasn't, it wasn't like the Shema, or it wasn't like the parchment of a mezuzah. It was, it was a mystical, let's say, essay to protect him from the evil eye. And he, after the Holocaust, he wore this under his shirt. He didn't see it. He never saw it. He took it out for me just to show me. And he wore it till his death. 